We were talking a little bit earlier about the, uh, about the cleansing of the temple. We talked about it in terms of the, the sacrificial system and the power of what happens with that mercy and that veil and the, the amazing things that God does. Um, and that, that crazy goat, you know, that goat bothered me for probably 15 years that they were letting my sins go free out there somewhere. That bothered me and bothered me and bothered me. And it, and it was such a release, such a relief to finally understand that that goat was the, one of the biggest symbols in all of Scripture, that the reality of sin is that finally, at the end, what God finally does is he just lets it take its course. He's been interrupting it all this time, and he lets it take its course. So to, to tonight, as we close, I'd like to go back into the sanctuary, but I want to go in the New Testament and I want to see a different kind of cleansing of the sanctuary for a different reason, okay? And I think tonight you will find, as we talk through this, that God is trying to get people into heaven, not keep them out. That Jesus is a great reflection of the image of God, and God is for us. I think all those are really clear in what we have to talk about tonight. I'm calling this making room for prayers. Making room for prayers. Jesus said... Quoting Isaiah 56, 7, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Probably a passage you're pretty aware of, pretty famous passage. Jesus went into the temple of God, drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. This is one of those moments when people say, you see, Jesus gets mad. This is what people do when they want to justify the fact that they're being angry with someone. See, Jesus got mad. And this isn't actually what you're seeing here. Jesus is not blowing his top here. Jesus is doing a very important, very significant thing. And yeah, I think he probably is not happy about what's going on. you got to understand what's going on behind all this. This, this. this precinct up there, I tried to make this picture more visible. It actually probably looks less visible after I mess with it. Um, the precincts of the temple, if you were to take that length over there, that whole temple precinct, almost a mile almost a mile of that, that space up there. The temple is the part in the middle, right in the center. And this court that's closest to us is the court of women. There's actually a little, you can't really tell too much. They go up some steps, and there's a little bit of a, what's called the court of men beyond that gate that you're looking at. Only men, only male Jewish men could go. Only male Jewish men. The female Jewish men could not go in there. <laughs> that's a subject for Gary to talk to you about. Through that gate... Through that gate is where the offerings were made. That, through that gate is where they would, they would you know, kill the lamb. The priests would then, or the Levites would then gather the blood. The priests would take it in to the, to the temple, which is that massive building in the back. Okay? The precincts around this, on this, my, uh, or your left side, is the portico. That portico that they always talk about where people are learning and teaching. And those two little things there that look like bomb shelters or, or something that you'd store ammo in or something like that, those are actually exits from a stairwell that comes from below up into it. They actually have a very cool stairwell that comes up and winds up inside. And um, they would, so they would, you would come out of those two. And around in all of those little colonnades, people would gather to teach. People would gather and, and do various kinds of ta- training and teaching. However, it's nice and clean and nice and clear. This is, this is an actual model. That's a, this picture is of an actual model in Jerusalem. Um, but the, if, you, if you were to think about that whole precinct now being packed full of businessmen, it's like a flea market, okay? So think of it like your local flea market. Think of a, a nice, like, one mile by, oh, you know, maybe half a mile, big square open flea market. Because that's kind of what's going on here. People have come in here with tables. They're selling doves. They're selling various sacrifices. They're exchanging money. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And the priests are the guys who control these little businesses. Okay? And so the priests are getting wealthy by bringing all of this stuff into the sanctuary and by making you buy their stuff. It's a true, true racket. Absolute Low down racket. When you came into the temple, if you were bringing money from anywhere except for the temple, you would have to have your money exchanged. And you know what? It just happens to be that today the exchange rate isn't in your favor. Sorry. You know, I'd love to do better for you, but I can't. Right? And you have to buy your sacrifices here because if you bring one all the way from home, the likelihood of it passing muster is pretty low. In fact, 
it's almost impossible to bring something in there and get it past musters so that you can take it in to have it sacrificed. And so the priest is going to look it over and look it over and look it over and look it over and say, this one's not going to work. And he's going to take it aside and say, I'll give you, I'll give you, you know, maybe one third price for it. But here's one that will pass. And this one's, I'm sorry to say, we're running a little short. And so it's a little expensive. I wish I could do better for you. And the people are coming and they're trying to come to God. And the priests have decided to make this flea market their way of making money and keeping people from reaching God. So what do you think bothers Jesus about this? Everything, maybe? So Jesus comes in, and he starts flipping tables, okay? Now, you, you, we have this great picture of Jesus, and it's, it's this, you know, it's, it's, it's almost demure, you know? He's almost dainty in some pictures. But you have to remember, Jesus is a construction worker, Okay, so don't think, don't think little, you know, dainty, frail, a wind would blow him over sort of a guy. Think hard hat, tool belt. Okay, think lots of sun, kind of brown skin. He's been out, he's been working. The, the kind of carpentry that was being done in Nazareth was actually mostly being done for the building of, a, at the, the time when Jesus is doing it, is mostly being done for the building of a city a few miles away. So Jesus is probably actively involved in the trades getting materials and making things for that city that's being built. So when you think of Jesus, I want you to think he's a little more imposing than most people paint him, okay? So don't think little guy flipping tables, okay? Think big guy running around flipping tables. He also has 12 guys who seem to always be stewing for a fight, following him around while he's flipping tables, okay? So you, you got Jesus flipping tables, and you got Peter and John with, with their leather jackets that say thunder and th sons of thunder on the back, right? And, you know, they're, they're with him, and he's flipping tables. These guys have not seen Jesus do anything this fun in a long time. And he's running around, he's throwing these money changers, money's flying all over, birds going out of their cage, you know, animals, and he's running people out through the gates. People are disappearing. All these people who are, who are out there to collect people's money are exiting as quickly as possible, okay? So I want you to think the first thing that's happening here is a bunch of people and a bunch of chaos and stuff. people are leaving. Stuff is leaving. People are gathering up their coins, putting them in their pockets, running out. Maybe some people are gathering up some coins that aren't theirs, putting them in their pockets, running out, okay? And the place is starting to clear. The whole flea market's clearing in just a few minutes, okay? Which was his point. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. I want you to understand where that passage comes from. This, uh, this passage from Isaiah 56 is a very specific thing. It's a house of prayer, but it's directed at very specific people. I'm going to pick up verse 3, and I'm going to pick up verse 7. You can read the others later. Isaiah 56, verse 3. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I I am a dry tree. What's he saying? He's saying, don't let the people who are on the fringes of the church feel like they're separated from the church. Do you catch that? Do you see that? Do you, do you catch that in that phrase? He's saying, don't let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord, don't let the person who's a convert, don't let the Gentile who joins himself to the Lord, who joins himself to the church, who becomes a part of the body, feel like he's not part of the body, Right? Okay, and he says, don't let the eunuch, now, you can say a lot of, a, a lot of things. Uh, eunuchs are mentioned multiple times throughout the scripture. Some are made, some are born, and there's just all sorts of things, comments made like that about him in the scripture. But they were an outcast. They were a lower class. We were talking about that strata of people. Even a Jewish person who was eunuch would be sort of a, a segment of the population on the fringe. And he says, don't even let the eunuch say, behold, I am dry. Meaning, the, the people aren't accepting me because I'm a eunuch. Okay? Okay? Then we're skipping down to verse 7. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house. So what's his plan for these people? Bring him to his house, save him, make him joyful in the house. In my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted. 
So the, the sacrifice of the eunuch, the sacrifice of the Gentile, they'll be accepted. They'll be accepted upon, for, uh, upon my altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Yeah, we all ought to praise God because we're the others who have gotten in. You know, we're kind of coming through a side door into this relationship. We were not born into this relationship, okay? I don't know, maybe, most of us at least. I can't look around the room and try to decide who's, who's what, but. He is saying, there's a bigger group. I'm letting all those people on the fringes get in. I'm accepting their sacrifices. They will find a joyful experience in my house. They are my children too. Okay? So I want you to think about what the context that Jesus is quoting. One of my professors made, a, made us read a book when I was first in seminary. He, he handed us this book by Henry Morris. We had to read this book. I, do, I could not quote you another author, the author that I had to read in seminary. Okay? Other than Ellen White. I knew we read a lot of Ellen White in seminary. But all the other people, but I remember Henry Morris. I only remember one thing about him. I remember two, well, I remember two things about him. We had to take a test. And the test was like within the first four weeks of class. Here's your book. Read this. We're having a test in four weeks. Like, oh, man, welcome back to school. And Henry Morris made one point that stuck with me from there to now. He said, when you see Jesus quoting something in the New Testament, you need to look at the context of that quote to see what's undergirding what he's saying. So when Jesus comes into the temple and he starts throwing tables around and chasing people out, people start running for the exits. And then he declares, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. He's not just casting out any old phrase. He's quoting Isaiah. And the context of Isaiah are the people on the edges, the people on the fringes, the outcasts, the people who aren't accepted normally. They will be invited into my house. They will be joyful in my house. Their offerings will be accepted in my house. They will be my children. They will welcome here. Amen. Isn't that good news for us? That's what is going on in the context of this thing. That's what's going on as Jesus is flipping tables. And then look at this. I didn't notice this until a couple years ago. Then the blind and the lame came to him. Where? In the temple. And he healed them. The very people that he was talking about start coming in. So imagine this, this picture. People with their, with their money falling out of their pockets and their doves under their arms and herding their animals out are making for the exits and they're taking off out of the exits and they're telling other people, he's going crazy in there. He's going crazy. He's tearing everything up in there. It's crazy. Oh man, he's got those big burly guys following him all around. Don't go in there. <laughs> Who goes in? Blind and the lame. The people who had been kept on the edges, kept on the fringes, kept away from Jesus, kept away from God, they're coming. The people who are keeping them from God are leaving, and so they're coming. The doors are open, the gates are down, and they're on their way in. This, my friends, is a rock. You knew that already, didn't you? But written on this particular rock is a warning to foreigners that if they go into the sanctuary, their blood will be on their own hands. So what does that mean? If you get in here, your death is on you, right? There were, there were these stella, these little signs around the sanctuary. Warning the blind, the lame, and the foreigner, stay out. <laughs> well, it's, it's Braille. It's Hebrew Braille. <laughs> he said it didn't help the blind. <laughs> but there were signs warning people not to come in. The very people who were coming in now that the others were leaving were warned not to come in. You know what was supposed to go on out in that court of the Gentiles? Evangelism. They were supposed to be out there teaching people who didn't know Jesus, drawing people into Jesus, and instead, they're out there selling stuff that's keeping them farther away from Jesus. You know what's amazing to me about this? Is in this whole story, nobody realizes God isn't in the sanctuary. He's standing out there in the courtyard where Jesus is wandering around. Instead of into that sanctuary in this glowing light over the, oh, over the absent Ark of the Covenant, by the way, instead of that, Jesus, God, the presence of the holy creator of the universe is walking around among the people, flipping tables and healing blind people. 
know, when Jesus gets involved, everything gets a little mixed up. Heaven gets to earth. God reaches man. God takes the shape of a man. He does stuff that a man can't do. It all gets a little bit squirrely when Jesus gets involved. Happens to you? Happens to me. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Verses 6 to 8. This is where this tradition comes from. You remember, do you remember when David was capturing this mountain that the temple gets built on? Remember that? This mountain used to belong to the Jebusites. David then led his men to Jerusalem to fight against the Jebusites, the original inhabitants of the land who were living there. The Jebusites were never tossed out when Israel came in, and they're still living on this mountain. The Jebusites taunted David. This is an unwise thing, I think. Did they not know this man's reputation? The Jebusites taunted David, saying, you'll never get in here. Even the blind and the lame could keep you out. I, one of the traditions of Israel is that they sent David a letter. And the letter said, the regular guards have gone home now, and we've put the halt and the blind and the lame around the fence. We'll be fine. They taunt David, saying, there's no way you're getting in. This is an impenetrable. In, impenetrable place. You'll never get in here. Even the blind and lame can, hold, can keep you out. For the Jebusites thought that they were safe. But David captured the fortress of Zion, which is now called the city of David. On the day of the attack, David said to his troops, I hate those lame and blind Jebusites. So he didn't like being taunted, apparently. Right? I hate those lame and blind Jebusites. Whoever attacks them should strike by going into the city through the water tunnel. That is the origin of the saying, the blind and the lame may not enter the house. By the first century, this is the textual reason for not letting the blind and lame into the temple. We don't need a real text for an excuse to make make our own opinions about someone else known, right? We have found lots of pretexts in the Bible for things like this, and this is just another one of those pretexts. You're going to seg segment the population. You're going to separate out the blind and the lame, not let them in, because David said, well, you know, David said, I hate those blind Jebusites, so the blind and the lame can't come in the temple. Not very good theology, but it was all the excuse they needed to post the signs. And if you Gentiles, and if you blind people, and if you lame people get up too close, do you remember when the Apostle Paul comes in? He comes into the sanctuary, and he brings Timothy. Do you remember the hubbub over that? Even though Timothy had been circumcised, they were all mad because Paul had brought a Gentile into the sanctuary. Who stays out? Who has no access to God? Blind, the lame, the Gentile, pretty much anybody who can't afford it, so the poor. Look at this temple precinct thing again. If you think about it, it's designed for separation. It's designed so you can monitor the population coming in, so you can check the gates and make sure only the right people get in, right? So instead of having greeters, you have Mickey. Now, I know that Disneyland has changed a bit, but do you remember Mickey? Mickey? When you went to Disneyland as a kid, those of you who are kids, this isn't true. So this is just for those of us who are like 40 and up. Do you remember Mickey? You remember? You can't go on this ride unless you measure up to what? Mickey's hand, right? There was Mickey's hand. And this was the standard. You can't get in the church unless you measure up to Mickey's hand. There's a bunch of guys standing by the gates holding up a little white glove saying, sorry, you don't make it. Sorry, you're broken. You can't come in. Sorry, you're of the wrong kind. You can't come in. Oh, sorry, you look poor. You can't come in. And they then got into the temple precincts, and once people finally got past Mickey's hand and got inside, they said, you got to have the right money. you got to have the right offering. You can't make it in because you don't have the right stuff. Oh, empty your pockets. I'll take the lint too. And the people who were there to reach the world for God had set up barrier after barrier after barrier to actually get to God. Oh, by the way, if you get, you get past all the other stuff and you're a girl, you can only go that far. Because you're a girl. You got to stop. We could have a long conversation about this, but you can take that home with you. 
every time they got a chance, they segmented the population and said, no, not you, no, not you, no, not you. And here comes the Messiah walking around the courtyard, flipping over tables, chasing these guys out, and saying to the halt and the lame and the blind, come on, come on. They're gone now. Come on, come on. They, somebody knocked over Mickey. You can come in. You can get on the ride. My, we used to have a Mickey's hand in our church, and one of the little kids came up and asked my friend, my associate pastor Greg, if he could have it. So he gave, him, he gave away Mickey's hand. So if you got a Mickey's hand laying around your house, mail it to me or something. We used to take it up on the platform once in a while and just hold it up just to remind people that we don't have Mickey's hand here. We stole it from Disneyland. They don't even have it anymore. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did. Now, I, you, you got to think about this. Jesus is healing people in the sanctuary. When the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did. What, now, if you had heard that sentence, and if I said to you, when Gary saw the wonderful things that he did, what would you expect the reaction to be? Positive, good thing. He'd be clapping, he'd be applauding, he'd be singing, he'd be doing something great. Gary would write a song and play it on his piano, Right? He what? He cut off the money. Oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. Yes, exactly what Jesus did. He cut, them, he cut off their funding. When the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They were indignant. Here are these kids who are being healed. Here are these people who are being healed, and they're crying out, Hosanna, which means save us now. Son of David, save us now, son of David. There is Jesus standing in the precincts of the temple. Do you think he had to hold back on that temptation just a little? You know, for these people are crying out saying, save us now, save us now. You know, he could have transported them, right? He could have just beamed them up like Scotty. And they started clearing the place of the people who want to be saved right now. Lord, I want to be saved right now. Get rid of me, I'm out of here. Boom, boom, boom. Wouldn't that have been cool? And then Jesus beamed them all up. Verse 16, and he said to him, do you hear what they are saying? Well, they're shouting it. He probably hears. Jesus said to them, yes, of course I hear. Have you not read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected prey. Here's that great, this great picture. In walks Jesus into the temple. He looks around. It's a flea market. And he goes, get out of here with all your stuff. And he starts turning stuff over and chasing people out. And they run for the exit like rats off a sinking ship. And out they go. And when they go, the guards are down. And in come the halt and the lame and the blind. And Jesus begins to heal them. And they start taking up this cause. They start taking up this voice. And they start with one voice saying, Hosanna to the son of David. 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 Save us now, Jesus. Save us now, Jesus. Save us now. They had not had access to to Jesus. They had been kept away from the sanctuary and the temple all this time, and now they've got access, and they've found their voice, and they begin to shout out, and the people around him who are running things, who have been keeping them out all this time, those people saying, keep those people quiet. Don't let them say that. Stop those people from saying that. Stop them, stop them, stop them. Every time somebody cries out for Jesus to save them, somebody stands up and says, shut those people up. Bartimaeus by the gate, Jesus, Jesus, shh. Palms laid out down the hill in front of Jesus and the children are standing along the side and the people are standing along the side saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And the Pharisees quickly come along and say, shh. He enters into the temple, runs out all these who have separated the people from God and the people come in and they start shouting, save us, Jesus. And they say, shh. You know, for a long time we've been listening to that shh. The church has been so quiet when we probably should be shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna. 
to the son of David. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Save us now, Jesus. 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 Wouldn't it be cool if the, if the heavens open now? You saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand and it started to come toward you. More glorious as, that got, as it got closer, more spectacular. And the heavens opened up and you didn't have to say, save us now, Jesus, because save us was happening right now. The times look right. The world's a mess. And I know generations have said this, and generations have said this, and generations have said this. And I don't know if I'm going to meet Jesus on the layaway plan or on the face-to-face -face plan. I'm okay with either one. But it sure seems like we might see Jesus now, doesn't it? It sure seems like we might be one of those last voices. Turning our eyes toward heaven and saying, here he comes. Can I give you a picture of what I hope the church does when they finally see that cloud appear? You know what I hope the church is doing? You know, we have these beautiful pictures of, of, of the, er, the earth kind of going crazy and stuff falling down and volcanoes and crazy things happening, the end of time sort of things. And you see all these believers standing there looking up to heaven, and they're all like this. You know what I wish it looked like? I wish that every believer in every picture was kneeling by, beside someone who was lost and frightened and calling for the rocks to fall on them. And the last thing that the church did before we went to be with Jesus was to extend his compassion for those who are lost. If any of you are painters, could you get onto that one? I would like to see one like that before I die, where all the believers are caring for somebody right before Jesus as the clouds are opening up and the people are running about frightened and calling for the rocks to fall on and the people are saying, I'm so sorry you missed this. I'm so sorry. And the last thing the church is doing is being compassionate toward the lost. Instead of standing there going, it doesn't look like, I don't know. I can't imagine myself being lost in the event and forgetting about the person who's dying right beside me. I don't know. If you got that painting skill, would you paint that picture, please? Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have perfected praise. You know who's crying out? The uneducated. You know who's crying out? The poor. You know who's crying out? The newly envisioned. You know who's crying out? The person who's jumping up and down because they can. These are not the intelligent. These are not the teachers. These are not the, the, the theologians. These are not the priests. These are not the temple guards. These are not the Levites. These are everybody else. These are those people. And those people are now our people. And we are the ones crying out. That's our voice. Because we're all on that sign that says, you foreigners, don't come in here or your blood will be on your own hands. That's our sign. That's the separation that was put before us. What I want to know is, is there a sign like that outside your church? Are you sure? You're looking outside your church. Are there people who would walk in the door and would be uncomfortable? I told you about the guy during the week who was in my church. He'd been coming for about, oh, I don't know, probably about a year and a half. And he said, you people don't really want to know me. Are there people who would come into your church who would not feel safe? Are there people who would come into your church who would not want to be there? Are there people who would come into your church who would be on the those people list? Is there a sign? Maybe it's invisible to you. Maybe it's only visible to them. Do you want the halt and the blind and the lame? Do you want the person who's poor? Do you want the person who's not cleaned up and not dressed up and not looking right and not looking like you? Are you sure you want that person? Are you sure you want that person? Then church has to be the kind of place they feel comfortable in. You know what you need to do? 
This is just symbolic. Go buy one of those outside ashtrays with the sand in the front of it. Set it out by the curb. Set it out by the front door. You know what it says? We expect people who might have a smoking habit to come. We need to give them a place to put their cigarette out before they come in the building. Doesn't it? It's very symbolic. I mean, it's hardly anything. But it says something. Put the nice people out front to greet. (laughs) You laugh because it's not true. You got mean people greeting. Put them somewhere else. Put them in the kitchen with somebody who knows how to handle mean people. (laughs) With a knife or something. No, I'm sorry. I had a lady... When I I first came to my church, there were like 60 of us, 80 of us. We did not have enough people to start discriminating. A person came in. She was wearing slacks. I saw her later. They looked like nice slacks to me. This lady went up to her and said, I'm sorry, ma'am. Perhaps you don't understand that we don't wear slacks here. Now, I'll tell you why I know this story. Because my head elder was right behind her. She stepped up. My head elder was a lady. She stepped up, and she goes, oh, that's not true. And she pushed her out of the way. (laughs) And she said, you'll be fine here. You're welcome here. Come on in. And then she took this lady aside and said, what are you doing? That's what she thought she was doing. Have your nice people out front. Maybe put somebody outside the door. You know, we have, this, we have this thing that we do. We all stand with greeters inside, which means, by the way, if you're trying to get in the church, you have to cross the barrier and come to us. At least get out there on the curb. You know, the best time, and it doesn't rain here much, but the best time is to go out when it's raining. Get some big umbrellas, put them in the hands of some happy people, and let them go out and help people walk into church. It's a crazy, crazy simple thing to do. But if we're expecting the people of God to come in, we need to make it as easy as possible. You know what Jesus is angry about? He's angry about all of these gates, all of these doors, all of these hoops people have to jump through to get into church. He's angry because there's a guy standing there saying, sorry, you don't make it. You don't get in. Sorry, you don't have enough money to make an exchange to buy the right animal to make the sacrifice. Sorry, you don't have even enough to buy a turtle dove. Sorry, you're not doing it today. You're not meeting Jesus today. You're not meeting God today. Sorry. In the church, we do this. We don't do it, I don't think, intentionally, but we do it. We do it all the time. We set up these little barriers that people have to climb over, and they have to fight their way into the church. It's a wonder anybody joins the church. They have to fight through mad little mean little old lady out at the corner. They have to fight with grumpy man down around this corner. you got to go stop Deacon Grumpy from talking to people when they come into church. In fact, you might want to find them a different job. I've been a preacher for 30 years. Breaks my heart. I'm about to offend somebody, just be forewarned. If you have the vegan monitoring your potluck, get them out. I don't want to say anything bad. If you're a vegan, good on you. But you're not in charge of the Pollock. You can't be. You have too restrictive a diet. You can't be filtering everything through your tiny little filter. You can't. The chocolate cake hater, get him out of the kitchen. Amen. You would not believe how many churches have fights over chocolate cake. You can't have chocolate cake. Why not? Show me in the Bible where it says I can't have chocolate cake. It's, 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 it's laughable, but it's painful because it's true. It's only okay on Sabbath. Okay, good. I'm all right with it for you that way. 
But you get what I'm trying to say? Just as surely as these tables were set up and people were being told, I'm sorry, your money doesn't work here. I'm sorry, your lamb won't work here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. As surely as those people were building up barriers to keep people away from God, our church has gotten the habit of doing the same thing by measuring the outside of a person and not letting their heart discover Jesus. I'm not asking you to throw out all the standards of life in the church. Only about 90% of them. <laughs> because most of them are not supportable biblically. We put a bunch of stuff out there as obstacles that God never intended us to have. You know where we're supposed to be? Out in the highways, in the byways, seeking the lost. Loving the person who's broken. Loving the person who's hurting. Loving the person who doesn't know if they want to meet God. Building relationships with people who, who have openly told us they don't want anything to do with our religion. We're supposed to be caring about people just because they're people. We're supposed to be loving people because God died for them. Whether or not they accept it isn't our problem. Christ's method alone will have success in winning people. He met people as one who desired their good, met their needs, won their confidence. And then when they had a relationship, when they had a friendship, when they were connected, he said, follow me. We are supposed to be in relationships with people who have no interest in God, just in case. That's what we're called to do as church. Jesus is angry and he's flipping over tables because these people have put barriers between everybody and God. Let's not be guilty of anything like that. Let me put one last piece on you before I go. <laughs> Is God trying to get people in in this story? Yes, he is. Is Jesus representing God in human flesh in this story? Yes, he is. Is God for those people? Yes. One last bit. Would you do this with your hands? Now close it. There's a link between me and Jesus. It runs through thousands of hands. There's a link where somebody told me about Jesus. And that person was told about Jesus. And that person was told about Jesus. And that person was told about Jesus. That person was told about Jesus. And that person was told about Jesus. And that, about Jesus. And that, about Jesus. And that link goes directly through the hands of all of those witnesses to Jesus himself. There's only one way that chain gets broken. That is if I don't pass it on to somebody else. The only place it can stop is with me because it's already arrived with me. The call and the challenge of the church is to take what we've been given and give it away. To discover new things with new people and deeper relationships with others, deeper relationships with Scripture and give it away. Because the only way it goes to the next generation is if this generation speaks. One of the things I'm most afraid of in the church is bald heads and gray hair. The church is getting old. And we're saying to so many people who would be part of who we are, Sorry, you're too young. Sorry, your music's too loud. Where's Jared? <laughs> sorry, you're, you're, you're inappropriately dressed. Sorry, 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 sorry. And I got my hand firmly on the person, and it's going to stop right here with me. Can I challenge you with the hope, with the call, with the responsibility 
of not letting the change stop at your house. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we have built a friendship and a relationship over the last week that will join several and many and hopefully all of us together in your kingdom. We have glimpsed your heart in the scriptures. We have found ourselves connected with you in ways we hadn't before. Lord, I pray that what we've gathered here at Camp Meeting for the last week will bring us greater maturity, deeper connection, more Christ-likeness, and that all of those things will be shared with someone else. Lord, help us to buy tapes if we need them, read books if we need them, find people who can help us figure these things out, but to continue to grow so that we can reach more people for you. Thank you for Pastor Ray Hickson. For Lloyd Wyman. For Mary Brown. For Paul Stockstead. For Gary Vendor. For the links that form my chain. I promise. keep making links. We commit ourselves to stop building barriers and keep stretching this chain. In Jesus' name.